Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey the Snapchat Keymaster, not Griner. That's an attempt at a <laughs> Ghostbuster joke for all the people older than Mark. You'll know who the Keymaster was. I this happen to love Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, and okay. I do know. Okay, I get your reference. Even <laughs> though that movie was before my time, I still had it on VHS. <laughs> Anyways... On today's episode, we will be discussing Project Ghostbusters, which isn't nearly as fun and happy as Corey is making it no. out to be. Uh, before and after that, though, we will chat about Bad two... Master. Bad Keymaster. Bad Keymaster. Keymaster wasn't a good guy. Well, that's a good point. I mean, he was, a, he, was a, he was a compromised good guy. Maybe that's what we'll be talking about with Project Ghostbusters. Who knows? This code name is just really on the nose. Hats off to uh, <laughs> the Keymaster and his company. Uh, before that, though, we'll discuss a supply chain attack that was days away from pretty devastating impacts and another supply chain attack that unfortunately did manage to nail a bunch of nerds. Uh, with that, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how we describe ourselves, by the way, being that we're getting after you. Yes, if that wasn't already clear from the other 300 episodes of this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> With that, let's uh, exec our way in. Ooh, ooh, fancy. Yeah. But EPDR like might catch that if it's a bad exec. Depends on what it's running. So let's uh, start with the first of, I guess, two supply chain compromise stories today. Wow. And this one's I, honestly a pretty big deal. I feel like this is one of those like seconds from disaster uh, scenarios where, you know, maybe not seconds, more like days from disaster, but potentially a pretty dang big issue. And Although this, this one could have been a big deal because of the nature of the package, but luckily we might have got lucky on this one, right? Although the other as one's long not as so, you are, uh, so good. As long as you're not a Kali Linux user or Fedora. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so without beating around the bush, um, on Friday, a software engineer at Microsoft discovered and disclosed a supply chain attack against SSHD's SSH server application on Debian and RPM-based Linux releases. And he found this while troubleshooting a couple odd issues with his server. He was uh, experiencing issues with like slowdowns and excessive resource consumption when he went to go log into his SSH server. And being a software developer, he immediately hooked up Valgrind, which is a memory monitoring utility in Linux, uh, to start figuring out what the heck is going on under the hood. Um, and after he hooked up Valgrind, he noticed a bunch of really weird errors popping up in there uh, that ultimately led him through investigating and narrowed it down to a compromised version of the XZ Utils uh, utility for Linux, uh, which is a, I mean, I've never heard of this until about a day ago or so, um, a relatively obscure but widely used utility on almost every single Linux and even Unix based system, uh, responsible primarily for like data compression. And specifically, he found that an adversary managed to insert a secret backdoor into versions 5.6.0 and 5.6.1 of XC utils, uh, which were subsequently picked up by the beta releases for a couple of popular Linux versions and the production releases for a few more as well. So, I want to break this down. It's a pretty big story with a lot of interesting moving pieces. And to start with, let's talk about like what this backdoor actually does. Um, so it inserted malicious code uh, into the public key authentication handler for SSHD. So with SSH, any command line remote access tool, you can authenticate with like a username and a password, or in this case with a RSA or whatever cryptographic key. Uh, he found that while verifying a SSH public key, if that key matches a certain fingerprint function, the key contents are then decrypted using another pre-shared key uh, before that key is actually verified. So basically, an attacker can uh, insert malicious code into a cryptographic key. If that key fingerprint matches something a vulnerable or attacked SSH server, or what's the right word for this? Compromised? Tainted? <laughs> whatever. Um, it will extract that malicious code, decrypt it, 
and then run it as system. So as root level permissions on the underlying server. That's a pretty dang big deal. This is effectively like a pre-authentication vulnerability in that the attacker controls the uh, the key that allows them to run this malicious code um, under the guise of the SSHD process. Um, real quick, what was impacted? Uh, so a few different versions of Linux. So Fedora Rawhide, which is their development distribution of Fedora Linux, Fedora 41, uh, Debian's testing, unstable, and experimental distributions, uh, OpenSUSE's Tumbleweed and OpenSUSE's Micro OS, and for all our hacker friends out there, any Kali Linux version downloaded between March 26th and March 28th. That's a... So this, it's relatively limited scope. He was only able to hit like dev testing and unstable, like nightly builds for Debian. But this is pretty close to making its way into like the production version of Debian and Ubuntu even. If it wasn't uh, caught so quickly, it would have been a pretty huge scope thing, obviously, over time. Yeah. So how did this happen? Um, well, Ars Technica and a few others did some investigation, some sleuthing, and they found that this all starts with a GitHub user with the username uh, Jaya T seventy five, who uses the name Jaya Tan when committing uh, code to open source repositories. This user's first public commit was made in November of twenty twenty one to Lib Archive, a popular archiving utility for Linux and Unix. Uh, this commit now retrospectively is actually suspicious as heck. So they claimed that they were adding like additional error handling uh, to one of the logging functions in here. Um, but in retrospect, it's a bit su suspicious because the code they were replacing, they actually replaced two safe uh, like custom functions for printing out text with two unsafe ones in there that in theory could allow an attacker to like play with escape characters and potentially cause this uh, lib archive utility to like spit out secrets. Um, so in retrospect, it looks like they're already off to a bit of a fishy start back then, but that commit was actually merged in and is still a part of LibArchive right now. Uh, so in 2022, then they submitted their first patch to uh, XZUtils. And almost immediately after that, um, a never before seen participant uh, named Jagar Kumar uh, also joined the discussion and basically demanded that the XZUtils um, owner, maintainer, was not being responsive enough, and they needed to bring in another developer in order to maintain this project. And so like taking a step back now in hindsight, it looks like this person, this Jaya T75, submitted a patch and then created a bunch of phony accounts that had never been seen before, basically argued themselves into a developer spot uh, on the XE Utils uh, utility. But this was back in 2022. And then in January of 2023, they made their first direct commit to XCUtils and then increasingly became more and more involved in the project. They even reached out to another project called OSS Fuzz, which basically does like open source vulnerability scanning and analysis for uh, open source libraries and asked them to disable the function that theoretically would have caught their backdoor that they were going to inject a little bit later. And then finally, this culminates in February of this year, uh, Jaya T75 issued a commit to uh, version 5.6.0 that added their backdoor. And it looks like they also quickly discovered that bug with Valgrind throwing errors, like a really popular memory profiler, um, that they immediately released a fixed version, 5.6.1, and then proceeded to email like all of the Linux distributions, begging them to quickly merge in this bug fix, presumably so that other developers out there wouldn't immediately catch what was going on with this issue. So like a few things in there, like this was like a long con, like they started this back in 2021, 2022. They at least became a maintainer or a developer in XCUtils like two years ago. And it wasn't until now that they finally hid this pretty dang sophisticated, and we'll get into how sophisticated it is, uh, backdoor in this utility. That's pretty nuts. Like this, like. I don't want to, I am going to put on my tinfoil hat because this is definitely a tinfoil <laughs> hat moment. This seriously feels like something from like the NSA or this like it, trying to insert a backdoor into some obscure package that something massively critical on almost every single Linux system uses 
and only because one bug or screw up that the entire like thing get blown. Like if this hadn't caused issues in Valgrind, I don't think anyone would have spotted this for a no, very long yeah, time. Yeah. yeah, it's nuts. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Corey? Do you think this is the some could be any state, state sponsored? Actor? Yeah, yeah, could be any state sponsored actor, possibly. Who knows? I, I mean, I guess a normal cyber criminal could be this for forward looking, but yeah, obviously a big deal and why we worry about supply chain attacks. It's pretty nuts. Like when you look at how they hid this thing too. So most, uh, most software includes built into the software, like code repository, some test cases, basically they're designed for once you compile the source code into a program, there's some prepackaged test cases to make sure like each little important function kind of works. And their backdoor for this was just a new set of test case files. They were just generic looking binary files. They even had a readme that came with them saying, this file is to test this function. This file is to test this function, whatever. Mm. Those were the actual function names that were retrieving those files. But behind the scenes, they weren't testing their functionality. They were extracting code hidden in these files and injecting it into the build process to modify the build process itself. Uh, and insert this backdoor that would only execute in like a very certain set of circumstances. It had to be a 64-bit operating system. The operating system name had to be Linux GNU, so Linux-based system. Uh, it would only execute if this package was loaded by SSHD. SSHD. So if you just used it in another process, it wouldn't. And it specifically looked for various debugging environment variables, made sure they weren't set or else it wouldn't execute. Apparently, they forgot about Valgrind. be fun. But- yeah, <laughs> it's I I know I'm totally tinfoil hatty, but this is such a like long setup for it and a pretty dang good job, all things considered, to hide this like threat that it it seriously feels like it's someone, some nation. Yeah. State. Like I can't imagine many just like cyber criminals, like run in the middle of cyber criminals that would go to this level of effort to do that. It'd be smart. And we do know state sponsored actors are going after devices, which makes me want to ask you, what do you I, 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 like? I, I'm, this is not rhetorical, but I'm, I know my answer to this question. What about things out there like Fireboxes, which run Linux? Should we be worrying about this X, Y command against all those uh, devices, appliances that also, you know, build off the same type of uh, Linux components and might even build off some of these uh, Linux distros? So for Firebox customers specifically, you don't need to worry. They're not using a vulnerable version uh, that was released in just the last like 48 hours. But in general, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like this is a dependency of a dependency that like if you're not specifically monitoring for those kinds of things and aware of these issues, like it's. It this could be in any Linux so device. I would yeah. say the good news is I feel like the fact that they caught this so early like if this wasn't caught for weeks, it probably would spread to all these IoT, all kinds of other devices that are going and grabbing dependencies as they build software. But I feel like now, hopefully it's not going to sprinkle out to lots of different devices, but it totally could have. It was one of those attacks that totally could have affected all kinds of IoT devices, networking hardware, let alone the computing systems themselves. Literally, like anything that ran Linux or Unix that had SSHD, the most popular SSH library, would have pulled this down as a dependency at some point in the future had this gone undetected. That is a massive breadth of impact uh, from a simple compromise of a relatively obscure or unknown dependency floating out on GitHub. Like this... This really shines a light on some some of the one of the major the major weakness of open source software reliance is if you don't have the right visibility into this, like you're effectively trusting other people's code not to be malicious. And that's a pretty dang sketchy situation for the entire yeah. ecosystem of software to be built on. Gotta just say good on you, Microsoft dude, that was paying attention in Valgrind and instead of just ignoring some unexpected air actually dug into it because uh <laughs> that sounds like we have them he or she to thank for or he it sounds like for for uncovering all this they uh in their 
post they sent to uh, OpenWall, or specifically the open source software mailing list on OpenWall, they even, so they showed like the profiling they were doing. Uh, so profiling meaning when they were testing the, the login function of like a good version of SSHD versus this kind of broken one, it was seriously only slower by like a couple tens of milliseconds, Dang. but it was slower enough that they're like, huh, something suspicious. And they went and rebuilt their own version of it with val Valgrind hooks in it to go and like profile uh, the actual, it's, it's crazy that like, this could have been missed had they been difference. like, you know what? Good enough. You know, maybe it's a bad day. Milliseconds <laughs> versus 40 milliseconds. Totally fine. Maybe it's my crazy. easy wire is just worn out. <laughs> <laughs> like that would slow something down. The good news is like every single major operating system maintainer has uh, their current versions are safe. The affected versions were relatively limited in scope. It was basically, you know, those Fedora versions and Kali over the course of two days. And if you didn't happen to download one of those during those two days, you're fine. But this, uh, it, it, Seriously, this one scared the bejesus out of me once I dug into it because this was one example. Like this could happen with any other dependency of a dependency hidden somewhere down below the software supply yeah. chain. Makes me uh, feel like and this is one that a lot use. of it is open source, which is maintained less. I that's not the right word. It's probably maintained professionally, but being open, <laughs> there's just a little bit easier for other people to become part of that long con open source process. I feel like that this is a potentially really good use of artificial intelligence. Like I'm picturing a future where Microsoft decides to be benevolent in some cases and donate resources from Copilot to like help secure open source software on the internet since they own GitHub. Yeah. And like they use some tool like that or whatever comes out of that new DARPA challenge that's happening at DEF CON this year and next year. And they proactively look for not just vulnerabilities, but like intentional compromises of open source utilities to flag them. Like it's impossible for human beings, I feel like, to go manually review every, every single, single one. thing. Oh, gosh. So this could be a good use for artificial intelligence in the future. And the interesting thing is you wouldn't have even caught this if you were just monitoring the GitHub repository uh, because the uh, code that they delivered to the package indexes, the tarball of like the actual source code that like Linux builds when it's deploying itself was actually different than what was hosted on GitHub. And that's, <laughs> I guess, normal in some cases yeah. where sometimes there's little differences, you know, test cases, different build setups. So it's not like you can like look at GitHub and see, oh, there's the malicious commit right there. Although in this case, they did actually commit all the malicious code off like a child development branch, just not in the main one. But the bundle they delivered was just entirely separate. And that wasn't even enough to raise red flags because that happens too. <laughs> Normally, it's, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Man. But hey, bullet dodged. Thank goodness. And Unfortunately, the bullet took off a little bit of the skin on our face as it flew by, but at least it didn't embed itself in our Linux skull at this point. We'll probably take a little pause, but there's more supply chain goodness coming up later. But what's next, yeah. Mark? Before that, I want to talk about Project Ghostbusters. Uh, that so... sounds fun. That's how, that, that must be a really good thing. I love Ghostbusters. Are you about <laughs> to kill my 80s nostalgia really hard? Unfortunately, and your love for all things meta and metaverse. You know um, that's not true. If it weren't for <laughs> VR, I would. I'm barely hanging on just to keep my darn VR headsets working. I am not a meta fan. And well, uh, this story won't change that. The story starts with a lawsuit against Facebook, or I guess their parent company, Meta, where just last week, a court filing in California uh, released new documents relating to a secret. Facebook project that they launched in 2016 called Project Ghostbusters. And this name actually has a meaning because the project was designed to intercept and decrypt network traffic of Snapchat users. And if you're not familiar with Snapchat, the icon for Snapchat's a little ghost. So Ghostbusters is a, a pretty good name for it. Yep. Um, so the documents include emails from Mark Zuckerberg uh, to other executives, basically like lamenting about their lack of analytics on Snapchat users. They were saying, you know, we are in a competitive position with them. We need to understand 
analytics around how Snapchat users are using this app and we can't get to it because it's all encrypted, blah, 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 blah. And they ended up using uh, Anovo, which is like a VPN-like service that Facebook acquired back in 2013. Uh, I think we actually talked about this back in 2019 after TechCrunch did some investigative reporting and found that Facebook were secretly paying teenagers 20 bucks a month to install this application, which was at the point called a Facebook Research, which basically man in the middle of all of their encrypted traffic through this VPN. So they used this technology ultimately uh, to because it allowed them to install a Facebook developer CA certificate, both on iOS and Android, which then let them inspect encrypted traffic. So Anovo uh, developed these kits, as they called them, uh, that could be installed on mobile devices to intercept traffic for specific subdomains, uh, starting with Snapchat, uh, allowing them to read all encrypted traffic so that they could then measure in-app usage for Facebook's competitive analysis. Um, that same court filing includes documents that Facebook later expanded this program to also target Amazon and YouTube's apps as well. And while the executives were all arguing they needed these analytics, some of the engineers internally, I guess, were raising a stink. There's one quote from an email in these court filings that says, uh, quote, I can't think of a good argument for why this is okay. No security person is ever comfortable with this, no matter what consent we get from general public. The general public just does not know how this stuff works, which I think is totally accurate. Like if I tried to explain a man in the middle connection to my parents, like their eyes would glaze over. But if they were offered, well, maybe not my parents, my kids, if they were offered 20 bucks a month, uh, to install this app from Facebook and they get paid $20 a month, they wouldn't yeah, add another eye at it regardless of what the uh, consent uh, agreement was. Oh, I'll, I'll wait till the end, but we all know there's like the, he says that no person would ever be comfortable with it, whatever the consent is. I, I will say there's one case, at least I will fight for men in the middle that's very specific, but we'll get into that at the end, I'm sure is one of our talking points. Well, yeah, I mean, let's get into that now. Like, so go for they, it. they're doing what we do on the firebox. I mean, they're they're doing it with less consent and hidden in EULAs, probably. You know, they're not telling their Anova VPN users that, oh, by the way, you're going to install this app, and not only are we going to, you know, VPN your traffic, but we're going to see all your traffic from domains we don't own too, and we're going to use that data. You know, but we technically use that same root C8 certificate concept to man in the middle of the exact same type of traffic. Now, the key difference is not to freak out our folks is we're not trying to monetize your data. We're not trying to find alternate ways to get paid the way Facebook does over and over again as an evil, horrible suck up all your privacy. That's why it's free company. We're just doing it so we can apply the security services, then re-encrypt it. And we're trying not to give any humans or processes extra views into that traffic. We just want our security services like malware protection to work. But it should go without saying Firebox is doing the same thing. Yeah. Go it, ahead. Uh, when you say we in this context, it is within the Firebox appliance. That data does not leave the Firebox appliance whatsoever. Appliance. Yeah, yeah. Just in case it wasn't clear. And, and um, we re-encrypt on the other end, by the way, which is a, it's, it might be a small thing. We're, we're taking a resource hit for that, but we're making sure that people, even in your internal network, still get the value of that encryption. Uh, the other thing, by the way, is this is fully under your consent. We, we can't do this without you configuring it. We can't do this without an administrator doing it. And I would say in this case, it is a security person that is taking the choice of enabling this feature, hopefully telling their users in some way, you know, what is happening for security reasons only. Uh, but I, I would say some security people would argue for man in the middle just to apply security services. I think we all wanna, don't want to, to leak private information. I want to give this whoever unfortunately <laughs> sent this email and became a part of the court documents. I want to give them a little bit of a benefit of the doubt and assume oh, that sure. their their context for this is Facebook as a company doing this without their users like explicit knowledge versus a in a business setting yeah. like protecting your organization from from cyber threats. 
I think that's a good point. So. I like to be honest. I think this person is right. I think they were a possible good, good whistleblower. So I, I'm not actually fighting this person's words. I, I think they were trying to actually stand up and do something good in a company that had been overreaching for purely competitive greed's sake. Not, not really. Like I, I don't know what good argument you can make for that other than greed. Uh, Whereas Considering they shut this, the whole thing down seven hours after TechCrunch posted their story back in 2019, <laughs> yeah. they clearly were pretty a little like guilty about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, at least this this one concept of why we do it is more more security related. So I, yeah. I I'm sure he he wasn't downplaying what we're doing either. But I think I, I agree with you. I think he deserves the right benefit of, of the doubt he or she, and they they probably were trying to to think about the the public well. You're not the only one that was thinking that this is all about greed. Like that's the whole point of this lawsuit. It was a class action lawsuit against Facebook from back in 2020. It's still ongoing now because law suits take forever in the United States. Yeah. Where they claim they, that now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they Sorry. claim they lied about their data collection activities and exploited the data from users to identify competitors and unfairly fight against these new companies what the whole point of the lawsuit is and this sure as heck seems to give some uh credibility to that argument yeah it's disappointing but, i mean at this point we do realize your privacy is their their monetization that's what facebook is there for it's simply there to suck up your information that's why you don't pay for it so we realize it but still seeing the extent they go to suck up even more than like the people that are on Facebook already know it and already have like knowingly given away their data. So why do you have to do all these tricky things that you're you're literally trying to hide from your own users? That seems yep. a little gross. I guess if there's any takeaway from this one or one big takeaway, be extremely mindful of certificates that you install on your devices, whether they be a mobile device or a computer, because at least proxy authority or what do they call them um, ca certificates uh, have a lot of power for decrypting effectively all of your web traffic now that said like you said there are legitimate uses in a business context for business devices but if random app you downloaded from super sketchy tells you to install this certificate maybe second guess it yeah i would say maybe even adding to that specifically vpn apps I, I like private VPN apps. I use them, uh, and it's not something I can easily replace with my own infrastructure. Yeah, like sure, I could put one server up in one place and have a VPN going through one place, but the value of being able to come out from servers anywhere in the world that have speed is very useful, and I like it. And the whole point of it is to kind of protect your privacy. It's because you don't want your ISP and everyone else watching to see all the stuff you do, but these VPN apps have power, like which one you pick makes a difference. And as you think about, even as I think about some of the promotions, my favorite one does where you can pretty much get it for pennies on the dollar for five years. You know, I'm like, is there something, you know, is this similar to Facebook's Onova offering me 20 bucks to use theirs or whatever? So, uh, uh, if if you're doing using a VPN app to protect your privacy, you better look into that company and and read the EULA inside out, and and figure out what's happening because while they're giving you good protection potentially, they have a huge amount of power as your VPN provider. Is your uh, is your favorite <laughs> VPN provider's website FBIHoneypot.gov? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that one. I hear I hear they don't look at anything. They never store your logs, nor do they ever come after you for all your wares collection. All <laughs> Which, <right. laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I don't use the FBI as my VPN server. Not that I have anything to hide FBI. Y'all are pretty cool. Yeah, agreed. Uh, but privacy is privacy. Uh, so anyways, screw Facebook. Uh, moving on to the <laughs> last story. <laughs> As Corey uh, hinted at, I guess as I stated early on, uh, we've got a second supply chain attack story here where research from Checks Marks, uh, they published a, an article last week about a campaign that occurred in early March targeting Python developers primarily in gaming communities. 
So this actually started with a Medium post from a security researcher slash developer slash gamer uh, where they noticed a Python syntax error in a one of the libraries that got installed with a package they were playing around with. Uh, the library is called Colorama. The legitimate version has 140 million, 150 million monthly downloads, but it was included as a dependency of a uh, an app for pulling stats for a game called Valorant. Um, so when they were running it, small game, syntax. no one's heard of it. <laughs> yep, <laughs> very exactly. popular competition game. Uh, so when they were uh, trying to run something, they noticed that they're getting this syntax error for HTML formatting in a random Python package uh, that they had installed. And when they went to go investigate, they pulled up the, the file that was causing the error. And if you're on the YouTube uh, screen, you can see the uh, screenshot Corey's pulling up where the file itself doesn't really have anything in it. It looks like it's got a couple of lines of code. Uh, down one more from there, Corey. Um, with effectively nothing going on. But they noticed that in VS Code, their scroll bar at the bottom indicated that the source code file was actually pretty wide. And so when they scrolled all the way to the right, if you want to go to the next screenshot, Corey, they actually found that the attacker had padded with a crap load of white spaces, a pretty simple malicious script in here that basically goes and downloads a file from a hard-coded IP address, pulls the body text out of it, and then pipes it to the Python exec function to execute. So they hid that way to the far scroll outside the normal pane of the source code file in hopes that if someone opens it, they wouldn't immediately see what the heck was going on in there. I was um, in the this, right place the first time, Mark. I you just you didn't trust me. I, correct. I have trust issues. I'm sorry. Uh, with the <laughs> This was the, uh, the first of like a five-stage attack chain of delivering different Python scripts that included gaining persistence through the Windows registry that ultimately culminated in info-stealing malware. They would go try and grab browser data, credentials from your browser, Discord credentials, crypto wallets, Telegram sessions, even files with specific keywords in their subjects, and Instagram session tokens. Um, and so this researcher, when they were reviewing the requirements.txt file, which is basically like the installation manifest for a, a package, uh, they found that that Colorama library uh, wasn't being downloaded from the legitimate package index, which is pythonhosted.org, but it was being downloaded from another domain, uh, pypihosted.org. And so they searched for that domain on GitHub and found about a dozen other repositories that appeared to be linking to malicious libraries on that same uh, malicious domain and effectively found that some unknown attacker had copied the legitimate uh, Colorama library, inserted this malicious code into it, hosted it on a malicious domain they registered to look somewhat similar to the legitimate one, and then compromised someone's credentials along the way and injected it into this uh, library. And seemingly they were waiting for other developers to go download it, get their credentials stolen, and then use that to continue spreading this across other libraries out there. Uh, they suspect, at least Checksmarks suspects, that the attacker probably stole the session cookies out of the uh, victim's browser because most of these accounts were protected with multi-factor authentication, but the attacker was clearly able to inject this code using the accounts of legitimate verified developers on github.com. Um, and this ended up impacting, I think it was 170,000 users had downloaded this malicious package in some way or another, or I guess 170,000 members of a very popular community on Discord that was also compromised for this too. So this one, a, a little bit different than that, borderline nation state one we talked about earlier. This one definitely feels like a cyber criminal type of activity of going and stealing people's video game credentials. What are your thoughts, Corey? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Valorant's related, targeting that Discord channel. It, it definitely seems a more smallly targeted one for sure. Uh, still pretty devastating, though. <laughs> it is. I mean, it shows the power of just having access to a legitimate GitHub repository. Like yeah. a lot, like someone that goes and installs this Valorant checker package, uh, the 
like ultimate thing that was compromised by this supply chain, they aren't going to go review the source code of every single dependency that gets pulled in from this package. In fact, they're generally not going to go review the requirements.txt file unless they're like a you know, security researcher that's very conscious of potential threats there or troubleshooting an issue like this one. And so by going after a dependency for it, like it makes it extremely easy to slip in under the radar without anyone knowing what the heck is going on. It's at this, I feel like this month is super scary supply chain month right now with all these different incidents showing just the uh, potential damages of some of these pretty simple attacks. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And by the way, you covered it, but this one has damages. It was looking for every single web browser. I almost, I'm being a little, but Opera, Brave, Vivaldi, Yandex, not just the normal ones like Chrome and Edge. And of course it could steal all the cookies, which likely was how they got some of those session cookies. Went after Discord data, same type of thing. Your cryptocurrency wallets, man, I hope at this point, anyone that has any wallets on a real online computer is kind of nuts. <laughs> you should uh, uh, air gap your cryptocurrency wallets. Telegram sessions, small little things, downloading a, a neat gaming Linux package in POW. There goes all your stuff. So I suggested with that last story, like AI is a potential solution for this. I don't really know any other solutions that can solve this problem at scale. Like there are so many open source libraries that are used by thousands of applications, millions of applications that end users have no idea about. And how the heck do you protect that scope of stuff that's managed by one single person where if their account gets compromised, now there's malware in the supply chain. Yeah, it really makes me rethink a little bit open source, not because it's open, but just because of the pure economics of these tiny little packages. They're they're open because people, one, one author is being nice and trying to get help, but in reality, they don't have many people helping them, and yet they're open enough for threat actors to do bad things with, so... Yeah, the, uh, uh, your AI idea, I mean, uh, <laughs> if you need billions of lines of code read and always checked on and the internet, uh, all the GitHubs or open source repositories on the internet, you know, roboted every few days to check things out or, or literally every few hours as things are committed. Uh, I think AI, you know, <laughs> some sort of automated service is really your only option. Because I don't think it's a... Uh... I don't think it's really solvable for like smaller software development firms, like larger organizations. If you look at things like like NIST's SSDF, they have recommendations where if you're going to use third party software, you should still read and review that software. Basically maintain your own trusted internal package index and only bring in trusted and vetted code. Only uh, save it into the package index once you have validated it's safe instead of just blindly trusting whatever comes from these software developers and package indexes. But like that is only something that's doable with a very large application uh, software engineering team. Uh, it is not something applicable to random software developer making random Valorant checker app thing. So it's tough. Like I, automation has to be the solution to this. And maybe chat GPT will actually save it. You know, what, Corey, I'm going to, I'm going to take a leaf off of your tree here and say <laughs> this is somewhere where maybe artificial intelligence can make us all a little bit better. And hey, help technology with some of these. actually can save us for once. That would Correct. happen, Mark. Optimism. Well, this is solving the issue of technology destroying us. So maybe AI can help us. I don't know. Either way, uh, if you are a, uh, a, a gamer, be aware that you are under attack from random stuff that you download off of Python package indexes and maybe be aware of the, the tools you're installing. Go Good download news, all so the Linux this space one, cheats. There's no problem with them at all. You'll be fine. There was no, uh, there wasn't any obvious description of like what endpoint software this particular developer was using, but yeah. speaking from experience on like EPDR at WatchGuard, it would have caught this type of activity of Python being used as a malware loader, downloading uh, other files and executing them through Python, from the exec function in Python. 
like this would have raised red flags and blocked the activity and at a minimum would have gone through the attestation service before it was allowed to execute for even Python scripts. So I guess another solution is use strong endpoint protection and uh, don't rely on Microsoft Defender. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you have any questions on today's topics or suggestions for future episode topics, you can reach out to us on Instagram at watchguard underscore technologies. Thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week. Please someone Instagram's turn off cool, Corey's video on. feed. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get the thumbs himself. up. Gotta get the thumbs up.